Welcome to this special report here on France 24. It's a stunning turn of events as Vladimir Putin accuses the head of the Wagner military group, Evgeny Prigozhin, of an armed mutiny. In a televised address, the Russian president said that decisive action would be taken to stabilize the situation in Rostov-Odon, a southern city in Russia, where Prigozhin claimed that his forces had taken control of all military installations. Putin also said that anyone who had taken up arms against the Russian military would be punished. And for our special coverage on this story, we're joined by our Kiev correspondent, Gulliver Craig, our former Moscow correspondent, Nick Holdsworth, will also join the conversation. We also have standing by Paul Vallet, an associate fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, and our international affairs editor, Oliver Ferry, joins me here on set. Thanks to all of you uh, for joining us. Uh, before we get to all of you, let's take a listen to what Vladimir Putin had to say a bit earlier today. I'm addressing the citizens of Russia, our armed forces, the personnel in law enforcement and special forces, all of those fighting on the front and who are fighting the enemy today. You are heroic, knowing what has happened this night. I have spoken to our military commanders this evening. I would like to speak to all of those who were tricked into joining this criminal adventure. Today, Russia is fighting a difficult battle for its future. We are fighting Nazis. Today, amongst ourselves, we are fighting against the, uh, the Western military and information machine. We are fighting for the lives of our citizens, for the right to remain Russia, a country with a thousand years of history. Today, this is a decisive combat for our country. We need to unite all of our forces. We need to be responsible. We need to set aside things that divide us, things that weaken us, because our outside enemies will take advantage of any vulnerabilities to weaken us from inside. So everything that seeks to break us apart can be considered as treason. This is a knife in the back of the people of Russia. This is exactly what happened in 1917 at the end of the First World War. Russia's victory was stolen from us. Different dissensions carried on behind the people's backs led to the loss of great swaths of territory. And following the tragedy of civil war, Russians killed Russians, brother killed brother. Various political and military traitors seek to pull our country apart. And we will protect our state and our people against these dangers, including dangers that come from within and treason from within. This is treason from within. Personal ambitions have led certain people to betray their country and their people. And Wagner's forces have been fighting alongside the Russian army. They liberated the cities of the Donbas. They fought, they gave their lives for the new Russia, for the unity of the Russian world. So these individuals who have organized the rebellion have betrayed those soldiers as well. They are trying to push our country towards defeat and capitulation. I repeat, any rebellion from within is a fatal or a potentially fatal threat for our country and our nation. It is an attack on our nation, on our people, and we will protect our country against this threat. We shall be strict with anyone who has chosen the path of treason, who has prepared this 
mutiny who has used these terrorist methods, they will be called to answer before the law, and they will have to answer to the people of Russia. Armed forces and the different state institutions have received their orders. Anti-terrorist resources have been provided to the region of Moscow and other regions. We will also undertake decisive actions to stabilize the situation in Rostov-Serdan. Civilian and military forces have been mobilized. As a Russian citizen, I will do everything to defend my country, to defend the constitutional order of the country, life, safety, and the freedom of citizens. The person who organized this armed rebellion, who has turned his weapons against his brothers in combat, has betrayed Russia, and he will have to answer for his actions. And those who are uh, calling on others to join in this rebellion, I appeal to you to make the right choice today, to preserve and defend what is sacred to us. Our, with our country, we will get beyond this current challenge and become even stronger. And that was Vladimir Putin speaking earlier. And we're back with our panel. I want to bring in Oliver Ferry from our International Affairs Desk. Oliver, help us understand what Putin is saying here. Are we now looking the at an open conflict between the Russian military and Wagner forces? Uh, well, he's certainly um, speaking about a, a mutiny, an armed mutiny. We don't really know how much of a conflict that particularly is. But certainly, Wagner has taken aim at the Soviet, or sorry, beg your pardon, the Russian military, and uh, it, and perhaps at at the Russian head of state as well. Even though that there there was no particular mention of uh, Vladimir Putin by Yevgeny Prigozhin in his various uh, messages posted yesterday and earlier today. However, um, uh, there are a number of interesting things where which Putin says he he refers to 1917. With, with regard to being stabbed in the back. And that that is sort of quite telling in itself. Putin has always had a fairly ambiguous relationship with Russia's Soviet past. Um, he's not, he doesn't speak particularly well always of the likes of uh, Lenin or Stalin, for instance. Um, but he's also, he also keeps a lid on criticism of them within so, uh, Russian uh, civil society. He, he is, of course, a former state agent of the Soviet Union as well. But he, he refers, just to wanted in, to in, refers to in 1917, for instance, uh, Russia lost uh, uh, m many parts of its, its land, its holdings. And by that, I presume he's referring to Finland and the Baltics. Finland, of course, remained a, a, um, an independent state all the way through then. The Baltics, uh, uh, the Soviet Union got back after the Second World War. But these are very much in line with what he is, his rhetoric in Ukraine. It's about uh, Soviet lands abroad, or about former Soviet lands abroad, which, which he would consider Russian. Of course, Ukraine is considered uh, Russian in the eyes of uh, Vladimir Putin. Okay, let's cross now to our Kyiv correspondent, Gulliver Craig. Uh, Gulliver, what kind of reaction has there been in Ukraine to these developments with the Wagner military group today in Russia? Excitement, mirth, and lots of speculation about how it might play out. But certainly Ukraine is very excited about these developments. The latest joke I've heard is um, everyone was saying that the Ukrainian counteroffensive would happen in, in the most strong way in the place we'd least expect. But did anyone actually expect that it would be Rostov on Don? People are seeing this as to Ukraine's advantage, no matter how it plays out. And that's not just ordinary Ukrainians. It seems to be a pretty much unanimous reaction from the Ukrainian leadership as well, with Volodymyr Zelensky, the president, also chiming in on Telegram, saying that what's happening today is part of the process of the disintegration um, of uh, the Russian Federation and a natural result of Vladimir Putin having made such a terrible blunder of launching 
unprovoked his full-scale invasion of Ukraine. I was just listening to Alexei Danilov, head of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council on the radio, who was almost crowing, saying that he predicted that something like this would happen, that he had actually said on the 24th of February 2022, apparently when that invasion started, that this is the start of the process of the disintegration of the Russian Federation. A lot of Ukrainians seem to believe that this could go very far indeed. There are some voices of reason, if you want to call them that, saying, though, that perhaps this will just be the first of several blows that will weaken Vladimir Putin's power, but that he'll um, survive this one and relatively easily gain some respite, perhaps eliminate Yevgeny uh, Prigozhin. I mean, who knows how it's going to play out? People weren't predicting two days ago um, when Yevgeny Prigozhin already started making some pretty harsh statements against the Russian military leadership that it would come to this as quickly as it has. Um, but people now are certainly um, uh, watching, watching with eyes wide open um, and some astonishment and, and not a little excitement. Remember, of course, the counteroffensive in Ukraine is still going on. Russians shooting at each other, as seems to be the case, at least near Bakhmut, with some members of Wagner shooting at some members of the regular Russian armed forces, can only be to the advantage of the Ukrainian military who are trying to push forward in that area. Okay, uh, our Kiev correspondent, Gulliver Craig. Uh, thanks so much. I want to bring into the conversation our former Moscow correspondent, Nick Holdsworth. Nick, help us understand what could be going through the mind of Yevgeny Prigozhin here. I spoke to an analyst earlier who said that Prigozhin has his own uh, political ambitions. How do you read what's going on with him? I, I think what's happened here is that Prigozhin has become increasingly angry with the Russian uh, military senior command, in particular with uh, the Minister of Defence, Shoigu, and the head of the General Staff, Garasimov, he clearly was very angered by what he claims was a missile attack on a Wagner base on Friday that he says that the Russian military carried out. And he's trying to effectively wrest control of the Russian military from the MOD, and then he says return to the front to pursue the war against Ukraine. Whether he has further political ambitions, I don't know. I do severely doubt whether that many people would rally behind him if he tried to topple Putin. At the same time, what we're seeing on social, uh, Russian social media today are images from Rostov and other cities of people welcoming the Wagner troops, helping them out. And we're also seeing some unconfirmed images of missile strikes on a column of Wagner troops headed towards Moscow, apparently. Uh, what does it tell you, Nick, that Prigozhin has not called out Vladimir Putin by name? He's still being fairly cautious, it's although he has been, he has been absolutely critical in the way. And says that he's been waged on and a bunch of bastards. Okay. Uh, Nick, let's cross now to Paul Vallet, an associate fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Thanks so much for being with us here on France 24. I just want to first get your reaction to this, uh, you know, astonishing turn of events with Vladimir Putin saying that Russia is in the midst of an armed mutiny. A totally astonishing uh, set of events. And the fact is that we're getting so many uh, evolutions uh, almost hour by hour uh, you know, even since the speech that we, we watched earlier, uh, that uh, obviously, well, first of all, situation is extremely confused, and uh, that obviously calls for us as well to comment with a great degree of com uh, caution on what exactly is happening and what might be the outcome. Um, I want to bring in again um, Oliver Ferry here. Oliver, uh, Wagner had an active role on the battlefield. What effect do you think this might have now that it's absent, now that it's you know, involved in this uh, you know, face-off with the Russian military? Well, it's the immediate, immediate effect with regard to Ukraine will be quite stark in the sense that Wag um, Wagner now controls one, possibly two cities, which are key points in the supply lines uh, for the Russian military into eastern Ukraine, they being Rostov on Don and also Voron uh, Voronezh, which uh, is supposedly has, has occupied. The local governor announced uh, the, earlier this morning that a fuel depot there had caught fire. So th those are two particular areas that potentially could choke 
um, Russian troops uh, regular supply lines into eastern Ukraine. Um, the, the very fact that they, will, that they may not uh, be present themselves around in, in such numbers as they were before in eastern Ukraine will also uh, diminish uh, Russia's ability to fight. You could also say that for, for many long stretches, Wagner were the most effective Russian troops on the ground, at least. Um, they, um, they may not be uh, present in the same numbers as before. But of course, Wagner itself, we don't know actually what they intend ultimately to do. They're, they're unlikely to take Moscow uh, on their own. They don't really have sufficient manpower. They're also quite exposed to uh, potential aerial attack if they do uh, march on Moscow. Now, they have supposedly taken down a number of uh, uh, Russian fighter jets and helicopters already today. They're, those are not confirmed just yet. But they really will be depending upon probably mass defection from uh, the Russian forces. Certainly, they managed to take Rostov on Don without, probably without firing a shot. It is suggested on some Russian telegram channels that they, if, that they chose late on Friday night because Russian troops were effectively overindulging in uh, refreshments on a Friday night. So basically, an awful lot of the Russian troops were too drunk and dazed, really, to react quickly enough. And uh, so the Russian military, where um, where uh, Wagner has been so far since the revolt last night, have been fairly passive. Some people have actually gone over to them, according to reports, while others have just more or less uh, stood aside. Whether that's going to be the case as they advance towards Moscow or try to advance towards Moscow is another thing. Uh, Paul Vallet, um, I'm interested to know what you made of Vladimir Putin's comments and how he's positioning himself in this, this showdown with Yevgeny Prigozhin and the Wagner group. Oliver Ferry was mentioning and pointing out that Putin was making reference to 1917 and World War I. Uh, yes, uh, the, the historian in me is, uh, of course, really struck by uh, this uh, sudden uh, appearance of the First World War and the revolution of 1917 uh, in Putin's messaging, uh, especially because he is really over-engaged in rhetoric that uh, concerns rather the great patriotic war, and the, so the Second World War in, in Russian terms. Uh, and that has been so much core uh, to his worldview, uh, as well as to his uh, uh, messages in support uh, of his uh, invasion of Ukraine. So uh, of course, to return to the, the situation of uh, uh, 1917 uh, in this situation, of course, uh, uh, is a stark uh, reminder. I think, you, you know, uh, Nick Holsworth was uh, pointing out, you know, very correctly, you know, this, this very ambiguous relationship that Putin has uh, with the uh, Marxist-Leninist revolution uh, in, in 1917. He was a servant of that state. Uh, to the last, to 1991, and 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 that is uh, something that he uh, has sort of a love-hate relationship uh, with, and um, uh, naturally, um, this is a scenario that. Uh, well, some people had speculated about when they were considering the the rot setting into the the, the Russian state during you know this uh, past year and a half uh, or so that you know uh, a, a a military defeat in in in, in Russian history uh, has often uh, heralded uh, some uh, po important and difficult. Uh, political troubles and 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 perhaps a civil war, uh, so this seems to be a little bit of a repetition uh, of uh, some of the uh, some of the the troubles. Uh, though it has to be said, I mean, obviously, if you were to compare the situation uh, with that of February uh, 1917, uh, I should think then the uh, forces of the the Russian Imperial Army were far more exhausted by their their three years of very hard fighting and and, and several defeats uh, at the hand hands of the Imperial Germans and, and Austro-Hungarians. Uh, this followed, of course, 10 years earlier, the, the defeat by the Japanese. Uh, so to some extent, of course, and, and a previous revolution in 1905. So the, the, the situation inside Russia was already far more unstable in 1917 than one really had the, has the impression now, where you still have, uh, indeed, uh, of course, a, uh, a mighty state security apparatus. And just the, the question of, 
what sort of support can Prigozhin uh, and his Wagner troops actually have uh, within that is is so hard to determine at the moment. And what you're saying, you know, and what your correspondent Keith was observing uh, as well, uh, we're not going to see until probably in the next few hours uh, and, and, and next few days, the degree to which loyalist forces uh, are actually opposing uh, the what the, the Russian central government calls the mutineers. Um, what, uh, how is that going to translate, in particular, alongside the, the, the Russian front lines? Are we really going to see, and the Ukrainians will be watching this very carefully, uh, where are the places where the Russian forces facing them are indeed shooting at each other, engaging uh, in uh, disorganized maneuvers, uh, transfers of uh, uh, personnel and so on. Uh, what uh, in all of this might be uh, of a nature to weaken the uh, Russian front line? And can, in these conditions, the Ukrainians exploit this militarily? They have a history, the Ukrainians, of operating very carefully according to uh, very good intelligence. Uh, they cannot uh, afford to waste personnel or equipment on wrongly thought attacks, so they will really only exploit any situation uh, where it is very clear that the Russians uh, in facing in facing them have become so disorganized uh, that they can be overwhelmed. Nick Holdsworth is our former Moscow correspondent. Nick, I forgot to ask you the most obvious question, which is, how astonishing is this that this is happening? I mean, Putin is talking about an armed mutiny happening inside of Russia. Well, it's completely astonishing. It's a game changer. Prigozhin has been uh, very critical of the Ministry of Defense for weeks and months now, arguing that his troops weren't getting enough ammunition. They were being thrown in as cannon fodder in the fighting around Bakhmut, et cetera, et cetera. And now we see that he's completely up the ante and is effectively heading a, a mutiny and encouraging regular serving soldiers in the Russian army to join him. He appears to have not really met with any resistance either in Rostov or Voronezh, where uh, it has now been confirmed that they have taken over most of the military facilities there. And I'm seeing footage uh, on Russian social media. Of course, it's unconfirmed. We can't uh, know whether it's a fact or not, but there's definitely footage on Russian social media, and a lot of it, showing uh, mortar shells uh, hitting a car park in a residential area, apparently in Voronezh. Um, a loud blast occurred in a military facility in Rostov earlier. And, of course, there was that uh, fire at the oil facility in Voronezh. Some of the footage I have seen uh, appears to show uh, a Russian military helicopter, whether it's one of uh, Wagner's or the regular Russian military, I don't know, appears to show uh, them dropping a missile on that facility, and then there's a, a massive bang and flames and a plume of smoke. So we really are beginning to see the unfolding of some kind of civil war in Russia. And if regular Russian troops are now being deployed to fire at will uh, on cities that Wagner has apparently taken over, that means the Russian army is targeting Russian civilians, and that's very serious. And of course, we also have so many different factors here. We have the security services. To what degree can they control the Russian interior ministry troops, which is a large force? We have Ramzan Kadyrov in Chechnya saying that he will side with Putin against Prigozhin. And there are various other actors in this scenario. But this definitely is a game changer. And it, as Paul Valerie just said a moment ago, in the next few hours and days, we, we will see to what extent this really changes the situation? Does this mean the beginning of a wider civil war in Russia? Or will it be nipped in the bud? And will Putin manage to hang on in power? Or will he be deposed by some closer to him who might then come to an agreement with Wagner to return to the front? As Wagner says, he wants to continue pursuing the war in Ukraine. Definitely, though, this is quite unprecedented in modern times in Russia, although, as Vladimir Putin himself said this morning, not unprecedented if you look back 107 years to 1917. Nick Holsworth is talking there, Oliver, about uh, various uh, vi you know, footage on social media, video, dramatic video showing Wagner troops. How do we go about verifying what exactly is true and what is not? It's, it's difficult to sort through that, isn't it? It is difficult. Um, you, we generally uh, rely upon um, generally open source intelligence operatives, such as uh, Bellingcat is the most obvious, but there are quite 
there are quite a, a few of them that manage to triangulate uh, these images and try and ge geolocate them uh, to a particular point. But uh, until then, there's generally claim and counterclaim. It's, uh, it's very much things done on the hoof. And we don't even know if there was actually any, as I said earlier, if there was any um, open fire between uh, Wagner and Russian troops. Uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin posted a, a video on his Telegram channel last night claiming that Russian troops had um, had attacked a Wagner camp, and he showed um, a video that that uh, which was you know location in the woods, which showed that there was some damage done, but it was all very unclear. It could have been an old video. It could have been a pretext for uh, launching this offensive last night. So there is really um, it there. There's a fog in every war, but in in a particular war in Russia, where particularly where um, the information ecosystem is fairly tightly controlled uh, and everyone has their own reasons for like maybe being a little bit economical with the truth, it's a little bit hard to uh, ascertain just as, na just as yet uh, what the truth might be. But it certainly does look like Wagner have reached uh, Voronezh, which is about halfway between uh, Rostov-on-Don and Moscow. Paul Vallée, I'm not sure you can answer this question, but what exactly are Prigozhin's capabilities? Uh, do his troops have the ability to take on Russian forces in any kind of sustained way? Well, that, that really is uh, the uh, complete open question mark that uh, we're all struggling uh, with. And, you know, what, what Oliver was uh, just saying, uh, indeed, um, uh, for my part, uh, I've, I've been wondering, of course, ever since uh, Bakhmut, uh, really just how many of Wagner are left because uh, there's been uh, so much talk about the fact that they they talk they took that city at, at, at very great cost and and, and Prigozhin has made uh, that uh, really a factor he's gone over and over uh, about uh, his his troops being sacrificed and 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 and, and under under supplied um, and now you know the the notion that you know all of a sudden uh, a bombardment of one of his camps last night uh, would have triggered uh, the whole uh, decision to uh, go into rebellion uh, and march on Moscow. Of course, if we're getting reports, well, uh, it's it's likely that uh, the areas where uh, Wagner units uh, have been concentrated is so in the area around Ukraine. So uh, if there were already a lot of uh, uh, Wagner in Rostov uh, or uh, in Voronezh, uh, that uh, seems a little bit logical. But for them to then, you know, move on to Moscow, uh, that uh, really uh, raises a lot of questions. Uh, and they cannot really do that uh, unless they um, actually get reinforced uh, by uh, other units that would uh, defect uh, and, and, and join join the rebellion. So, and of course, that would then raise the problem, uh, the question of just how long has this been in, in preparation? Is this a spur of the moment thing, or uh, has this been waiting to happen for, for several weeks or, or so? And, and that, too, is a big question mark we have today. We're coming up to the half hour here, and before we, we get going, I want to get some predictions from all of you. I know it's, it's really hard to predict, but how do you see this playing out uh, you know, in the coming days? Let's start with you, uh, Paul Vallée. Well, uh, certainly, uh, obviously, uh, the uh, immediate priority, at least for Wagner, is to rally uh, more supports, because they won't be getting anywhere uh, if they don't, don't get more than what they already have. Oppositely, uh, the Putin regime, well, they need to ascertain the loyalty of uh, all of their forces and to be able to contain uh, this uh, ups this uprising uh, in, in, in a geographical uh, sense. And, and as I said, you know, the Ukrainians, as far as they're concerned, are probably going to stick to their uh, previous plans, which is probe the Russian lines, see uh, where uh, there's eventual signs of, of weakness. But they're not about to engage themselves uh, into a full adventure trying to exploit uh, in the very short term, uh, what might outcome uh, from uh, this uh, internal strife in Russia. Nick Holdsworth, how do you see this playing out in the coming days? It looks like there's going to be some fairly serious clashes uh, between regular Russian troops and Pugosian's forces. Again, unconfirmed, but there's footage of a tractor-trailer truck with a, a manned tank on the back being 
hit by some kind of missile, apparently on a highway leading to Moscow this morning. Uh, as one of your guests was saying earlier, that needs to be confirmed by people who can triangulate these things and uh, actually check exactly where that was and when. It does seem quite apparent, though, that we are going to see some clashes. And the key issue, uh, which the British Ministry of Defence raised this morning, was whether those interior ministry forces will side with the Kremlin, uh, side with Prigozhin, or simply choose not to fight at all. Uh, Oliver Ferry, your prediction? Uh, well, I don't have any um, clear prediction. I do know there are going to be uh, winners and losers out of this. And no matter which way the, the dust settles, I don't think that Yevgeny Prigozhin is necessarily going to be a loser. There is, there is a possibility, even if Wagner does lose the battle on this, that he could actually survive and maybe perhaps even be forgiven by Vladimir Putin if Vladimir Putin himself survives. There is a, there is a history in Russia of rebellious forces being welcomed back into the fold if they prove to be useful. We saw that in Chechnya with Ahmad Kadyrov and his son, Ra son Ramzan, and also a number of figures in the 1993 constitutional crisis whom Boris Yeltsin uh, managed to incorporate back into his administration. So um, even if things don't pan out for Wagner and uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, I wouldn't necessarily write him off just yet. Okay, I want to thank everyone uh, for taking part in our special coverage here. Our Kiev correspondent, Oliver Craig, former Moscow correspondent, Nick Holdsworth, Paul Vallet, Associate Fellow at the Geneva Center for Security Policy, and of course, our International Affairs Editor, Oliver Ferry, joining me here on set. Meanwhile, at least three people were killed overnight in Russian airstrikes in Ukraine. Kyiv's interior minister said the attack struck at least five regions across the country. That includes a deadly airstrike on a high-rise building in the capital. Velika Behel has the latest. A city once again targeted by Russian bombing. Blood splatters the ground in Kherson after shelling struck this transport company. Around 10 in the morning, there was a strike on the facility. Russian forces continue to bombard the wider Kherson region despite flooding from the destroyed Hakovka Dam, which lies upstream on the Dnipro River. Though thousands were forced to flee their homes, the remaining residents have been working to clear the damage despite water shortages, still struggling to put their lives back together. We are so used to this that we are able to survive in any conditions, like rats. Despite the Russian onslaught, Ukraine claims progress in the east, where both sides report the heaviest fighting, and rejects the Kremlin's claims that the counteroffensive has failed. Indeed, we still have the main events ahead of us, and the main blow is still to come. Some of the reserves will be activated later. Moscow's Ministry of Defense, however, claims to have targeted Ukrainian high-precision weapon storage units overnight, though it did not specify a location. And that's it for now. Thanks for joining us for our special coverage, and stay tuned for more world news coming up here on France 24.